Hello everyone. Um, I apologize um, if I have to speak uh, softly. I'm under the weather thanks to the pollution in Hanoi. Um, I have sore throat and all that. Um, my name is Nader Hayigipur. Um, I'm a professor of astronomy at the Institute for Astronomy, University of Hawaii. Uh, my research is on the formation and characterization of uh, planetary systems, uh, dynamics and celestial mechanics, how planetary systems are formed, how they evolve, with the focus on formation of terrestrial planets, habitable planets, habitability. Um, I'm uh, um, I'll work on all these things, try to understand how habitable planets are formed, how habitable zones are evolved and all that. Um, I am uh, the president of the Division of Planetary Science and Bioastronomy of uh, uh, IAU and uh, I have the privilege of having some of you, including the president of uh, Commission 3 here. I'm very delighted to be here and give you this talk, this uh, uh, presentation. The talk that I'm going to uh, present here, the lecture that I'm going to give is specifically about formation. I don't have time uh, to go through post-formation evolution of solar system. I'm going to talk specifically how about planets uh, in our solar system are formed. I'm going to present some of the theories out there. The purpose of this lecture is not to promote any theory, neither is to um, say which one uh, is correct or not. It is to familiarize you with what is out there and then it is up to you uh, to go ahead and read and uh, take your own theory. Um, I start by giving a, a little bit of introduction, historic introduction, and uh, my style of teaching is like this. I'm not going to bombard you with uh, data. I'm going to carry you in, uh, along the um, state of thinking that has gone into planet formation. So you see how this idea started and why it is going the direction that it's going, and then you can uh, make your own choosing which theory to take. So, um, and, and in between, uh, we will have a transition going from um, growth of small bodies to growth of big bodies, and in between there, I'll give you about five minutes to recess and then we come back. To start, um, I want to tell you about how planets form and that uh, the only, up until about a few years ago, say 20 years ago, the only um, example that we had, the only laboratory that we had is our, was our solar system. Uh, we look at our solar system and we try to understand how planets in our solar system form. A lot of people came up with a lot of theories for it. For instance, um, in uh, 1971, Dorman and Wolfson came up with the capture theory. They said that <coughs> the material that went into formation of the planet was captured uh, by um, around the star. So the star was at the center, a lot of material was around it, it was passing by another star, sun, and uh, this secondary star had the planet forming material as it was going close to sun, sun captured it, and they developed its own uh, planetary system, and uh, the secondary star went away. So, um, the, as you can imagine, there are many problems with this. If you go back to the um, 70s and read that, read that paper, um, it tries to explain formation of Jupiter and terrestrial planets, uh, but uh, uh, it cannot basically explain properties of our solar system. Uh, there are, um, I will list all the properties that the, that the successful theory for formation has to address, and this wasn't able to do that. And soon it was forgotten. Uh, but what is interesting is that it was uh, several hundred years ago, uh, Laplace, who came up with the idea that um, the planet formation, planets of our solar system basically formed in an environment, in a flat environment like a disk around the sun from really small material. Um, he, said, he said that that area, he called it a nebula. And that nebula thing existed, um, and uh, material in that nebula, they grew and became planets. He didn't come up with a methodology for that, but he presented that idea, and the idea stayed from there. What I just showed you um, is, is a cartoon of how the nebula collapses, and then uh, how planets in that nebula form. Uh, if I want to put it in a more, um, I'll let this go a little bit longer. So if I want to put this in a more uh, qualitative way, I can break the planet formation into six different stages. 
uh, we, can, uh, we have the stage where the molecular cloud collapses, it forms the star at the center. The star, as I will show you, it has its own radiation and uh, interaction with the disk and it uh, clears its surrounding and leaves you with a disk of material um, that, is, that consists of gas and dust. And this disk of material is the uh, in, uh, birthplace of planets. This is small dust particles, they hit each other, they grow, 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 become big boulders, and the boulders hit each other, they grow, become moon to Mars sized bodies, and eventually you have planets. Now what I just showed you here, it gives you different stages, and what is interesting is that the, each stage has its own physics, and we can study them. The bad thing about it is that going from one stage to another stage is very, very tricky, and that is where the theories get stuck. I'm going to start from here, I'm going to show you a couple of cartoons of how this disk are and the where planet formation uh, occurs, but if, uh, to start planet formation, I start from there. I call that a solar nebula, uh, a disk around sun uh, where gas and dust exist together, and planet formation starts from a very early stage of dust coagulation growing to bigger bodies. <coughs> um, this is a cartoon of the disk, and uh, the reason that I want to show this is the way that the uh, central star interacts with the disk. It clears its surrounding and uh, as the sun, as the star center star forms, it has a bipolar radiation that causes the surrounding uh, get cleared except for the disk uh, in the, on the equator of, the, uh, of this star. Uh, there is, in, in the part of the disk that are up and down, you have the rain down of uh, solid material, in this case, um, dust particles into the mid-plane and then the mid-plane accumulates all this solid material and that is where planet formation starts. Um, I have just um, indicated some part of this disk as the accretion disk, the zone of comet formation when you are far away. What you see here is the distance with respect to the star. And uh, then you have uh, the region out there going past um, 100,000 AU, you have infalling of gas and dust to form the farther part of the disk. So like I said, it, it gives you an idea of where the planet formation occurs and uh, how uh, the uh, solid growth, um, where the solid growth takes place. This is also the same thing, but I'm now I'm showing it in a, a adjoint case. Um, again, uh, it tells you um, that part of the disk that is highly irritated and, uh, and interacting with the star, it shows the part of the disk that uh, planet formation is more effective, there were giant planets form. Um, also the dust settling, uh, uh, it all shows you the temperature variation. These are all uh, cartoons to give you an idea where I'm going with all this. Uh, they, they are not <coughs> um, quantitative. So with that, uh, you may ask, okay, is this uh, true in reality? Do they exist? There you go, they do exist. Um, you, can, you see the disk with bipolar radiation and all that stuff. So, um, and you see the, um, the puffing of the disk. Um, so, okay, you have a disk, let's start from here. You have a disk of gas and dust, and this is where we believe planet formation starts. So you have gas and dust, the dust is heavily coupled to the gas, dust molecules are very, very, very uh, tightly bound to the gas, they basically move with the gas. And the dynamics of dust molecules, although dust particles are solid and they're subject to gravity of the sun, but the interaction with the gas molecules is so strong that the gas molecules drag them around. Right. As a result of that, um, the dust moves around in a variety of different ways. You, you can't just uh, take a dust particle and say, okay, I'm going to um, study its dynamics as though it's an individual object. It really doesn't work that way because depending on its size and depending on where it is in the disk, its motion is going to be different. <coughs> Uh, up, dust particles of 1 to 100 micrometers, they basically move in Brownian motion and uh, they just randomly jump here and there. There is 
Um, something interesting will come out of this, as I will show you. But uh, because of the interaction that these objects have with the disk and because of the small sizes, the motion is basically randomly scattered all over the place. For those that are 100 micrometers or larger, then there is differential drift. It means that uh, the motion it becomes more pronounced compared to motion of the gas. They differentiate themselves from the motion of the gas. I'll explain that in a minute as well. And then equal size particles get heavily disturbed and perturbed um, by, um, by turbulence. Turbulence is something that uh, can prevent planet formation and in some cases may even help. So um, with that in mind, you have um, the dust particles moving around, interacting with the, uh, with the gas. Um, and uh, the only thing that they show um, that puts them away from gas molecules is the following. They are dust particles, they are solid objects, they are subject to gravity of the sun, right? So take your high school physics, you write force equal mass times acceleration. The force is the gravity between a dust particle with a small little mass and sun, the huge mass sitting over there, okay? So what is the effect of the gas, when we say the dust particles heavily coupled to the gas, it means that the gas is so, that the uh, interaction, the collision of the gas molecules to the dust particles is so strong that uh, it can dominate its gra the gravitational force of the central star. Okay, But still, here's the interesting thing. Still, <coughs> Dust particles, when they rotate around the sun, they go slightly different from the gas molecules. Gas molecules randomly go around. Dust particles, they go around with a velocity that is close to the rotational velocity of the gaseous part of the disk, but not entirely. In other words, two dust particles, they are moving with the gas but the slightly difference, and that the slight difference causes them in the frame of dust particles, these two dust particles gently come close to each other, very, very gently. And uh, when they come so close that molecular uh, forces kick in, they stick to one another. That's what you see here, right? These are <coughs> results of experiments uh, by Jürgen Blum and his, uh, <coughs> his um, team. And they showed that when you put dust particle ciliates uh, in, um, in a um, chamber and uh, you drop the chamber so it acts as though it's in vacuum, dust particles very, very gently come. And just when, when they're so close that the molecular, cloud, molecular uh, forces kick in, they just stick to one another, right? Now you have two micro-sized particles sticking to one another, but they are still so small. Remember the previous slide that I showed you? They are so small that still when they go around, they don't move too fast. They reach another particle and they come close and they grab that one and they go grab another one. And little by little they form fractal objects like that. <laughs> and this, this, this proceeds from submicron size to um, less than a millimeter, right? And uh, then you have, <coughs> so this is what I just, this is the cartoon of what I just explained. Two dust particles gently sit next to each other and they see another one and they see another one and they form these fractal size objects. Now these fractal size objects, they're still heavily coupled to the gas because their masses are small and uh, they move around and they see each other, they move around, and uh, sometimes they hit and break each other apart, sometimes they gently merge and become a bigger aggregate, become a bigger dust aggregate. This process continues until the mass, of the mass and size of the, this dust aggregate becomes so much that when they hit each other, this is the interesting part, when this dust aggregates, they hit each other, they roll each other, right? In order for this rolling to happen, your mass, the mass of the dust aggregate should grow, should become considerable, so when they hit each other, they can roll each other, and then you will, you start getting uh, small little um, grains, right? 
if the collision is slow, you see what happens. In a turbulent disk, you see less of this fractal fracture and more of objects hitting one another. Uh, in, a, in a non turbulent disk, you see more of the fractal, a fractal structure, and the objects maintain their fractal structure. They hit each other. This whole process is very, very gentle. Um, in simulations of dust growth, it takes um, a few to several hundred thousand years for this to occur. Uh, it is all based on molecular physics. You can quantify it, you can reproduce it in lab, you can actually write the equation and say what's going on. This all has been done. And uh, we get to a point that our dust particle gets to about, say, half a millimeter. Okay, this is all good. And still dust is heavily coupled to the gas. Still its motion and dynamics is dictated by a lot of collision of um, gas molecules to its surface. <coughs> so keep that in mind, just by just the uh, dust itself in the gas environment, by evolution and interaction with the gas, it grows naturally to about a fraction of a millimeter. Right? Okay, keep that in mind. Now what I'm showing you here is something very interesting. Um, this shows the radial distance from central star, in this case, Sun. And it's logarithmic. Okay. What this shows here is stopping time in Keplerian time. Okay, what does that mean? It means, <coughs> say at 10 AU, you take an object, any object that you want, those different colors, they show the, the radius of the object. Take one of these objects, take a meter sized object, go at 10 AU, right? And give it a Keplerian orbit. Remove everything, write your F equal MA, calculate the Keplerian velocity of that object, this is high school um, physics, right? And determine what the Keplerian motion of this, what the Keplerian velocity will be at 10 AU, and release it. How long will it take for it to lose its individual motion and it starts moving with the gas? Okay? For a kilometer size object, it takes a long, long time. For a small micrometer object, it takes a very, very, very short time. You put the dust particle in the gas and you give it Keplerian motion, Keplerian velocity, and release it. Soon after that, it loses its Keplerian motion and gets stuck with the, uh, with the gas and starts moving with the gas, right? <clears throat> that is why I said, with respect to one another, they move very, very gently, right? Now, this says something interesting. This says that as the size of the object increases, it shows more and more independence from gas. Small objects are heavily coupled to the gas. If you give them a flick, they lose their independent motion and they start moving with the gas. But if you take a kilometer size and give it a push, it keeps going and going and going as though the gas doesn't exist. Right? That's what this basically tells you. Now, here is the interesting thing. <coughs> uh, you grow dust particles because they basically move with the gas. Their relative velocities are small. They come together and they stick to one another. As they grow to become millimeter size, then they show their independent motion. Right? And the meter size shows something very interesting. So I'm going to show this in a different way. Now, this is the same graph, but this time I put the radius down here and I put the radial velocity up there. So this was, this was the distance and this was the Keplerian velocity. Now I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to take the radius on the vertical and horizontal axis and I'm going to put the same velocity on the vertical axis. Now what this tells you is that if the particle is small, it stays with the uh, gas. Uh, if the particle is really large, it has its own independent motion. But particles around the meter size, they rapidly move with respect to the gas. So you grow all these particles from dust all the way, you assume that, you, you know in the laboratory that you can grow these dust particles from micron size all the way to millimeter size. Then uh, the idea is that somehow millimeter size particles also hit each other, grew, 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 became bigger, bigger, 
they, they got to about meter size. And then these meter size bodies, they hit each other and become bigger, right? Except that once you get to that meter size, then the independent motion of the meter size body is so strong that they move very rapidly with respect to gas. They show the independent motion. Either when they hit each other, either they break one another and they don't stick, or they go all the way to the central yeah. star. If you take a kilometer size body and uh, put it at, say, 5 AU from sun, okay, and put a gaseous disk there as well, right, and start the, uh, Kepler, start the kilometer size body with its Keplerian velocity at 5 AU, right, it keeps going and it takes them a long, long time, something like 100,000 Keplerian orbit to um, show some sort of reaction to the gas. It basically doesn't see the gas for a long, long time. Whereas if you take a dust particle, put it over there, in, in a fraction of a second, it loses its independence and it starts moving with the gas. So what does this tell you? This tells you that even if you could grow objects all the way to about meter size, then the independent motion that they develop the independent motion that they develop becomes so strong that they rapidly move towards the central star. Either they get plunged into the central star or because they are moving rapidly, when they hit each other, they break each other. So you manage to grow them to, say, a meter in size, they hit each other and they become all dust. Or they don't even stay around to become bigger and form planets. This is known as the meter size barrier. So that collisional growth of dust particles uh, eventually gets hindered by the fact that when you grow them to about a meter in size, these objects don't stay around to become bigger or they shatter each other. The story doesn't end there. This, there is something else to it as well. This uh, is again the uh, results of the work has been done by Jürgen Blum. And what you see here is the radius of two objects, two objects uh, of different radii, you know, and uh, it's in terms of centimeters, so you have um, hundreds of centimeters all the way to 10 kilometers. Two objects, they hit them with each other with different speeds. So these dashed lines that you see that they say 50 meters per second, 75 meters per second and all that. They, they hit them with different speeds. And then they, they see in laboratory whether these objects stick or they shatter. Green means they stick together, sticking is okay. And uh, brown, yellow means maybe, red means none. Okay, now this is in terms of centimeters, right? 10 to power zero is one centimeter. You go up there, you go up here, you get to the red region. It means that even in laboratory it's been shown that even if you grow objects from, from dust particles to about a centimeter in size. The centimeter size objects, even though they are coupled to the gas, they are relatively coupled to the gas, when they hit each other, they break. They don't stick. They break each other again into smaller pieces. So now you have another problem. If you could grow them to meter size, they won't, don't stay around. If the, but before that, when you get to centimeter size, they don't even stick. This is called centimeter size barrier. Now, why are these barriers? Because of the following. These are simulations done by our Japanese colleagues. And what they did was that they assumed that the process of growth from, from uh, dust particles to kilometer-sized asteroids is efficient. And now they, you have a disk of kilometer-sized bodies. We call those planetesimals, kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers. They took a disk. And they said, I'm going to study how this disk that consists of several thousand of these kilometer-sized bodies, regardless of how they form, how this will behave if I put the sun in between and let everything uh, interact with each other through gravity. And this is, this is the result of the simulations. Okay? What you see here is the eccentricity of every object in terms of its distance from, the, from 1 AU from Sun. So they showed that the process of collision of kilometer-sized bodies and their growth is actually efficient. You can get bigger bodies and some of that kilometer-sized stuff stays as well. So 
here, um, I want you to think about this. Um, physics tells you that you can naturally grow dust particles to about a fraction of a millimeter in a disk, and that's all good. We know all the how to do that. And then physics tells you that if you could grow them to kilometer size, it is possible to grow them uh, bigger and make bigger objects out of them. In between, there is a meter size barrier, there is a centimeter size barrier. We don't know how to do that. Right. So that is the part, that is the transition going from one part to the other that gets us. And we don't know how to, how to go from that millimeter size to the kilometer size. So um, I'm a theorist, you know. Theorists have, uh, um, they have two things. Um, we work with a lot of things that in reality doesn't exist. And we have computers. And those computers help us to do a lot of things that in reality don't exist. Right? So um, nowadays computers are so powerful that theorists such as myself, I'm allowed to say this because I make a living doing that. So we, we make a model and then we try to find the physics for it. Uh, as opposed to physicists who start from physics and try to... <laughs> so it, the computers are that good for us. right? Um, so, you are a theorist and you are thinking that physics can get me to millimeter size and can get me from kilometer size to larger. And in between, I really don't know how to do it. And physics tells me that um, in between you have these two barriers, centimeter size barriers. So, what do you do? Um, either you have to come up with some sort of uh, smart way to get around this, or you have to accept that in, na in nature, things keep going and going and going and going until it happens, right? There is so many times this hitting and uh, um, collision and, and breakage and uh, accretion and re-accretion and collision and breakage, it happens until finally it works. Um, so some systems do have planets, some systems don't have planets, depending on which, uh, which direction this collision and growth went. Or you say, no, I want to find a way to get around these two barriers. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about, these are, these are two schools of thought. One school of thought that still exists says that collision or growth exists, it is inefficient, so in some systems it works, in some systems it doesn't. Okay. And uh, there's a big group that is working on that. There is another school of thought that says, no, uh, the collision or growth is inefficient, it doesn't happen. We have to find a way to jump over these two hurdles. Right. This second group works based on this idea. This is a paper, uh, a series of papers that are published with Alan Boss, and we presented the following idea. Uh, the idea that I'm going to talk to you about was mentioned by Fred Whipple uh, many, many years ago in, in um, 50s and 60s, and then in 70s it was mentioned in one line in work by Wyden Schilling, uh, but we actually put it into equations, and we presented equations and uh, mathematics for it. So, um, for a moment, whatever I said, just put aside and uh, think of this hypothetical system. You have a disk, sun is at the center, the disk has solid objects and gas. Okay? <clears throat> now, the solid particles see the uh, gravity of sun and they follow Keplerian motion. That's all good. The gas, however, doesn't follow Keplerian motion. Why? Because the molecules of the gas, on one hand, see the gravity of the sun. On the other hand, they have the gases has its own pressure. So the disk state become, gets to the state of equilibrium. We call that static equilibrium. Gets to the state of equilibrium when the pull of the gravity on the molecule and the pressure that wants to push it back, they counteract each other, right? You will have at any point, remember r omega squared again from your high school physics, remember this is centrifugal force, right? The centrifugal acceleration is equal to the force comes from gravity, the Keplerian, plus the force or the counteract that comes from the pressure. We call that pressure gradient because it varies based on the radial distance from, uh, from sun. Now here is an interesting thing. If, if the disk develops some sort of non-homogeneity, some sort of non-uniformity, in a region of the disk, the pressure of the gas is, uh, is higher than its surrounding area. I'm showing it here by a, by a ring. Now, in this region, for instance, the pressure of the gas, the density of the gas, is slightly higher than its surrounding area. Now, see what happens. 
objects, the particles that are closer in interior to that to that bump, they are they are interior to that bump. They feel the gravity of sun. Gas will act for them as a um, as a push from behind. So they are moving around with the gravity of the sun. The gas pushes them because of this thing. The gas pushes them from behind. As they are rotating, they also go out. The particles that are outside, as they are rotating, they feel the gas as a headwind, so they lose angular momentum. As they are rotating around the sun, they come forward. These two objects, they meet at the place where that is zero, where the Keplerian becomes equal to motion of the gas. Right? It's right at that top. This is called pressure gradient enhanced mechanism. A pressure gradient, for as long as it um, exists in a gas, will bring particles, dust particles, together, and dust particles get together and accumulate where the pressure gradient is zero. Right? So, uh, a group in <coughs> Heidelberg and later on in, uh, in Lund came up with the following idea. So, that is the disk, and you let the disk evolve on its own. And it develops all these uh, red parts, red and, uh, and bright parts, right? Those are where the density of the gas is enhanced. So these, for as long as they live, even if they are short-lived, for as long as they live, they affect the area, the accumulation of solid material in the area, and they bring them together. So when they go away, there are patches of solid material. The same solid material that wasn't able to grow to more than millimeter, now it gets together and forms a bigger aggregate. Right? Now, then they suggested that, that those bigger aggregates that can go around, and uh, those bigger aggregates then go around and become bigger and bigger as this um, non-homogeneity stays longer, it brings more and more dust particles together, and that aggregate becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, it doesn't go through the uh, meter size and centimeter size barriers because this, uh, this uh, accumulation brings all these objects together and holds them at the same place because of pressure gradient. And that way, you can form a bigger body by hopping over these barriers. Right? You don't go through the collision, you basically uh, bring objects together and let them be there and coalesce and form a bigger body. Okay. This is known as streaming instability. These are all those non-homogeneities that bring solid material and they form bigger bodies, right? This is known as streaming instability. Why streaming? Because you need a stream of material to come uh, close to these regions and they accumulate there. Why instability? Because when this material come here and they gather there, the regional density becomes so high that in that specific region, in that little per the place, the whole thing collapses into small pieces. So you bring in material around here. In that region, you have a small little, small little disk, but you put a lot of material to it. And that small little disk in that, in that little, little place can't handle its own uh, gravity and breaks into planetesimals. They call it streaming instability. The only issue with it is that it's very nice. Yeah, I explained the physics of it. It's, it's very nice. It works. And, uh, and the person who did it uh, has done a great job for past 10 years to um, develop it and makes its theory and its foundation and magnetic solid and everything. It's all good. The only issue with it is that it, it works inside that little box that I'm showing. It doesn't work globally. That's the problem with it. A planetesimal disk is 40, 50, 60 AU. That mechanism doesn't work in 40, 50, 60 AU. It works only that the small little box that I showed you. In other words, streaming instability does not get in ignited in a disk that about 100, 100 AU wide. Right? That's the big problem with it. And that brings me to this. How do you go from um, centimeter size or millimeter size to kilometer size is still an open question. Two schools of thoughts. One says collision or growth is the way to go and nature uh, either succeeds or doesn't. And the other one says, well, streaming instability may help and you can get around it. There are some others, I, I, I admit that there are a couple of other ideas that I didn't mention here 
uh, for lack of time, and also um, these are two uh, more prominent theories that have more prominent implications, as I will explain. So how do you go from growth of dust particles from millimeter size to kilometer size? We really don't know. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to start, I'm going to assume this whole process, this magical process works. Now we have a disk of planetesimal bodies, kilometer size, half a kilometer, 10 kilometers, with sun, and planet formation starts from here. When I say first, this is one, one good thing that I should mention. When I say first, it means the time of the formation of first solids, and by definition, first solids are chondrules, millimeter size objects. Right. So starting from the time that millimeter size objects are formed, it usually our simulations show that it takes about 700,000 years, maybe half a million years to get to this stage. And that is the time that <coughs> gas is subject to dispersal for a good amount. Um, depending on where this happens, some part of the gas will stay, and that is why we have giant planets. Uh, but again, depending on where it happens, uh, most of the gas goes away. Somehow magically we, we have a disk and this is where planet formation starts. A disk of planetesimals with gas, uh, depending on where, the, uh, where you are looking at planet formation, the gas may stay around or go away. And uh, these solid objects, they are subject to gravity of the sun and each other, and they hit one another and grow. So, okay, let's move on. If you want to explain uh, solar system formation, you have to explain many, many, many pro uh, problem, uh, not problem, properties and characteristics of our solar system. The planar orbit, the rocky planets are in interior, gaseous planets are outside, uh, prograde uh, rotation, impact craters, um, prograde uh, pro motion, prograde rotation, except for Venus, Uranus, and Pluto. So you're, you have to explain why it is like this and why they are not. And uh, rotation periods of several hours, swarm of materials around solar system. This, uh, this refers to uh, Oort cloud and Kuiper belt objects. Satellite, how satellites formed, what is the structure of the Kuiper belt and asteroid. I'm going to show you some of them, but there, there is a huge list. I just put some big ones here, and I'm going to explain um, some of this in a little bit more detail. Um, and then uh, you have to keep in mind, if you want to explain solar system, you have to explain solar system as a whole. You can't just break it and say, I'm going to explain formation of Earth and Venus, and uh, I have a theory for that. No, it doesn't work. You, your theory has to explain formation of Earth and Venus and uh, asteroid, structure of the asteroid belt and formation of Jupiter and Saturn and ice giants and uh, that uh, super Earth that Mike Brown has to explain all the goddamn thing together. Otherwise, it's not going to work. <laughs> so these are the important ones uh, that for us related to astrobiology, to life and habitability, these are the key elements. I'm going to show five slides. And so we use our solar system simply because our solar system is the place where life exists. We use that as a, as a um, laboratory to develop our models and then we try to apply them to other uh, planetary systems and extrasolar planets. If you want to explain solar system formation, you have to explain many of these and many more. And among them, a few stand out. You have to explain formation of terrestrial planets, and you have to explain why Mars is small. I will explain in about five minutes why this is a problem. Mars must be bigger than um, we get physically. Physics says Mars must be bigger than Earth, but it is small. You also have to explain why, uh, despite what we see, the density of Mercury is much higher than others. You have to explain the coplanar orbits and uh, why major planets, they're all pretty much on the same plane. They're inclined by a few degrees, but that falls within the uh, thickness of the primordial nebula, right? So you basically are in coplanar orbit. You have to explain where this water came from. Yeah, you know, this is our backyard, so you can come visit us. <laughs> and those of you who have been in Maui uh, perhaps have seen this. So you have to explain where the water has come from, right? And as the elements of life. Uh, you ha also have to e explain, your theory must explain the structure of um, asteroid belt. That is because the asteroid belt is the transitional environment from terrestrial region to giant planets. It is highly affected by the ex 
existence of giant planets. And that, as I will show you, uh, has um, very direct implications for the formation and delivery of vol volatiles to Earth. So you have to explain this. You have to come up with... Now, a couple of... Let me show you two slides of what are the structures here. If you, if you take this, um, by the way, you can get this picture right out of JPL. You go to JPL, you download all the <coughs> um, uh, orbital elements and you can make this yourself. Um, I don't remember where, when I made this, but anyhow, you can get this. And then you can make the following graph. You can take, uh, you can go ahead and uh, plot the number of asteroids versus their semi-major axis. Uh, and you will see that there are regions um, the where asteroids don't exist. And those regions correspond to what is known as mean motion resonances with Jupiter. In other words, if you put an asteroid here, its orbit gets highly excited by interaction with Jupiter, and it gets tossed out of the entire solar system. Right? There used to be asteroids here, but it got cleared. The same for here, the same for here, the same for here. These all, I showed some of them, but there are a ton of these resonances. Those numbers up there, uh, for those of you not familiar with the resonance, it means that if you put an object here and look at its orbital period, its orbital period, uh, the orbital period of Jupiter divided by orbital period of that object is like the number of three to one. If you put it here, the orbital period of that object is two and a half years. That's, that's what it means. So that those numbers is the ratio of the orbital period of Jupiter to orbital period of any object that goes into these regions. And they all, these all correspond to different resonances. Now, some of them are very tiny because the, the fraction is, is a fraction of two large numbers. Like for instance, um, there, is one, there is one here, there's one here is eight to three, right? And uh, if you look at this small ones, some of them are 19 to 17, right? 21 to 13, or things of that sort. Those are very, very tiny resonances. The, if the fraction is small number to a small number, then the area around that region is very large. You, that's why there's that large area around 2 to 1. So anyhow, um, you have to be able to explain this. And that has to do with the orbit and uh, evolution of uh, Jupiter. You also have to explain, you take the same numbers and you, this time you plot their inclination in terms of the semi-major axis. This was the, the eccentricity, this is the inclination. And then you see that there is a region, there are regions where the inclinations are pushed down to only uh, about 20, 25 degrees. And you hardly see objects with the inclination of 30 degrees and higher. But there are many bodies uh, with inclination less than 20 degrees. This is the effect of Saturn. And uh, this little six that exists here, referring to the six planets, Saturn, is the effect of Saturn. Saturn, with the weather, wherever it is, because of its resonance, it keeps the inclinations down. You have to be ex able to explain that as well. <coughs> so uh, these are the important ones that we, we have in our solar system. And then the rest of it, once you have a theory, then you can add small links to it to explain the prograde and retrograde motions, and you can move things around to explain the uh, Kuiper belt structure and all that. Okay, so let's start. <coughs> this is the disk of planetesimals. Uh, each one of these objects is subject to gravity of the sun. There is gas in here as well, but not as much as it was before. And um, now we want to see when these objects hit others, how they grow. Okay, so let's take one of them. Let's take this one, for instance. Okay, this one has a distance um, to, the, to the star. I call it a planet. Now, here is the thing. You know, we define a region around any object. We define a region around it. We call that Hill's sphere. What does that mean? It means that, the, see, see the Hill's sphere? It depends on the mass of the object. Right? And the reason for it is that any object uh, that has a mass, it has a gravity around it, a, a region of gravity around it. That Hill's radius means this. If any object falls within that sphere, these other secondary bodies, their dynamics is dictated by the direct gravity with the, with the body, and sun is a perturber. For these bodies here, this is driving the dynamics, sun is perturber. At this time, 
for this body, sun is driving its dynamic, this object is perturber. Okay, so I want you to grasp this idea of hill radius. When you have this region, anything that is inside that radius primarily sees the gravity of this object and sun is a perturber. So what happens to them is that they come towards the center of gravity and uh, they hit it, they stick to it, they become bigger. Once this becomes bigger, its mass increases, right? So that sphere becomes larger, it takes more of the bodies inside, right? So more bodies come, hit, and grow. And boom, 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 you start from a kilometer size in a very short time, you go to something that is called planetary embryo. It's moon to Mars sized bodies. This process is called runaway growth. And this is a cartoon of it. Two objects hit each other, they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And <clears throat> eventually, in a very short time, um, you, uh, as I will show you, in the tens of thousands of years, you start from those kilometer-sized bodies, you grow objects to be moon to Mars-sized bodies. And this is just a cartoon of how it, it, it shows. I showed you this before, and that's exactly what happens. Now I want you to see the time. Where did the time go? Oh, right here. In a very short time, they say 10,000 years, but uh, I would say depending on the uh, mass of the disk, this is a very small disk. If you put more mass in the disk, it goes to about 50, 60, 100,000 years. In a very short time, compared to formation of terrestrial planets, which, which takes hundreds of millions of years, this is a blink of an eye. So once you form your disk of planetesimals, in a very short time, the disk of planetesimals immediately drops into a bunch of large bodies interacting with one another. Okay. So keep this in mind. Now I want to add some small little things to it. This is a cartoon of the disk, and we managed to have that disk of planetesimals forming these bodies, these big bodies, right? Now, somewhere in this disk, something interesting happens. As you go farther away from Sun, uh, objects that are close to the Sun, they receive so much heat that if they have any ice, it evaporates and objects are dry. But as you go farther away, they maintain the ice because the amount of temperature they get is less and less. Eventually, it gets to a point that if you pass that, then these objects maintain most of their ices and uh, they maintain it for all their lifetime. Well, we call that a snow line. Where this is, is an industry by itself. I'm not going to get to that. But there is somewhere in the disk, once you pass that, your objects manage to maintain their ices. Now, <clears throat> this is a very interesting thing. I want you to follow um, what I said, but let me take a sip of water. All these bodies, they hit each other. And uh, they either shatter or stick to one another. Up here, these bodies are mostly made of ice. And when they go, also, when they are all the way back there, their rotational velocity compared to object here is smaller. So you have two objects that they go around, they are basically ice. They go around, they hit each other, their efficiency of their sticking and growth is much bigger than here. These objects are going around really rapidly and when they hit each other, they break each other. They are going around much slower and when they stick each other, when they hit, they stick because they are mainly ice, right? So once you start from kilometer-sized bodies and you form these planetary embryos, out there where, where dust, sorry, where ice stays permanently, you manage to grow big objects. There's this model that came out in 1996. He's, they said that, Polycarol, they said that out here, just by mere collision, you can grow bodies to about five or six uh, Earth mass, right? So this is the part. Time zero means write this. And then you let these objects over there, they hit each other and grow. In a very short time, they, they grow to about 10 Earth mass or something. But then back there, gas still exists because this whole process that I explained from dust growth all the way to this takes only a couple of hundred thousand years, maybe half a million years, 600,000. The gas is still there. Back here, there's more gas than here, right? So as these objects grow to become, say, five or 10 Earth mass, they're there is, they have swept up all this um, solid material in the surrounding. So this solid line that goes to solid material, 
their, their, uh, their uh, core does not grow anymore. But the core is so big that now it can attract gas. So it starts attracting gas. As it attracts more gas, it, its gravity becomes bigger, it attracts more gas, right? And more and more, becomes bigger and bigger. And it gets to a point that it attracts so much gas from its surrounding that the gas thickness becomes so much, it cannot withstand its own gravity, it collapses until it gets to an equilibrium. And that's when that happened. They said that is how giant planets form. This is called the core accretion model. Right. It can explain many properties of the solar system. It has a couple of major downsides that I will quickly explain. Okay. Uh, the biggest problem with it is that, look at the time. The time is about 8, 10 million years. But um, uh, the gas that is necessary here does not stay around for that long. Um, the observations show that the number of diffraction of uh, discs that maintain their gas for that long, uh, for 10 million years, is much, much smaller. And most of the discs, they maintain their gases for no more than um, one and a half to three million years. So it, you, this explains many properties of the solar system. It's consistent with what we see in solar system. It, it's all nice and dandy except for the time scale. So if you want the time scale to work, uh, you have to somehow speed this up. Um, people have done this. Um, I'm not going to get to that because I want to use the idea to explain terrestrial planet formation. Uh, there are two mechanisms to get around it, actually three. One is to uh, expedite this by putting more material into the disk. So if the disk has more solid material, the growth become faster, right? And uh, therefore, they have been able to drop the time to about two, two and a half million years. Another mechanism is, uh, is called disk instability, which suggests that instead of starting from uh, bottom and build things up, when the molecular cloud collapses and forms the nebula, the nebula, at some part of the nebula, the mass becomes so much that regions, local regions of the nebula, they break under their own gravity and right there they form um, giant planets. That is called disk instability that forms things right directly from the molecular, uh, from the, uh, molecular cloud as it collapses and the sun forms. Um, this is, a, is an interesting me method. And nowadays we think that it may explain some of the properties of uh, extrasolar planets with high mass and um, high orbits, in uh, long orbits. But um, uh, basically, as when it comes to uh, solar system formation, it has some fundamental issues. Uh, one of those is that when these collapsing things happen, the energy, uh, the potential energy heats up the system. You have to remove that heat very quickly, otherwise the whole thing goes away. Uh, and a good mechanism for removing that heat very quickly has not been produced. Um, so although uh, it is interesting, but uh, it fails at certain points. But regardless of whether it is valid or not and whether it helps or not, one thing is good about it is that it gives you a time, right? It says, if this mechanism is good, I can form giant planets in a few thousand years or tens of tens of thousands of years. So this was supposed to show you um, how the uh, disk instability works. But regardless of that, you have a mechanism that gives you an upper limit of 10 million years. You have a mechanism that gives you a lower limit of time of a few thousand years, right? Um, there's, a, there's pebble accretion. I, I will quickly explain at the end of my talk. Now, going back to here, regardless of what mechanism you choose, the upper limit is 10 million years, right? So let's take that. Let's say that within the first 10 million years, you form giant planets here with your uh, favorite mechanism. Okay, so now what happens here? As giant planet formation is in progress, that whole formation process affects this region as well, right? And this region also, uh, in this region also planetesimals are going around and hitting each other and forming big planetary embryos. The planetary embryos hit each other and they grow as well. So in this region, while that is going on, this type of impacts is going on. These are simulations that have been done um, by, um, uh, by our Japanese colleagues in 2006. And um, 
this, is, this whole thing is one industry by itself. You know, this, I'm one of those who does this kind of thing as well. We, tie, we take planetary embryos and planetesimals, we put them together, we bang them each other, and we see if we can form planets. Right? Has been going on since early 80s by George Wetherill. Uh, that was the person who uh, started this business. So what I want you to see is that this whole process of big objects hitting each other and shattering each other, re-accreting material, growing and everything, takes several hundred million years to form terrestrial planets. Right? It has some issues I'll mention, but it, forms, it takes several hundred million years. What does that mean? It means that Compared to what happens here, that, even if it takes 10 million years, it's just blink of an eye, right? It's very, very, very rapid compared to terrestrial planet formation. In other words, if you want to study what happens here, it would be reasonable to assume that giant planets have already formed. And that is what we do nowadays. When we do high resolution simulations like this one, we take many of these um, planetary embryos, moon to Mars sized bodies, and we put them in a sea of planetesimals. These are kilometer-sized bodies. And then we assume that Jupiter and Saturn are where they are, or we consider some different type of orbit for them. We assume Sun is at the center, and we let everything interact with each other through gravity. And then these are the snapshots of the simulations. What you see on vertical axis is eccentricity, on the horizontal axis is the distance. Uh, down here shows the mass of object, and the six, six snapshots, 200 million years, it gives you some ideas of what's going on. <coughs> now, um, uh, why do we need these planetesimals? Because if we don't put them in there, by these objects, by interacting with each other through gravity and with, the, uh, with giant planets, their eccentricities go up, like what you see here, and they shoot each other out and there will be no material to uh, form planets. We need these planetesimals to damp the eccentricity. Think of them as putting uh, um, sand uh, or, or uh, pebbles in honey, right? And you want to move it, it's really hard, and if you want to bring it up, honey uh, will, will uh, resist. So uh, the motion will be, uh, will be damped by these planetesimals, and the eccentricity is low, therefore the relative velocity will be lower, which, which accommodates collision and growth. So we need that. Okay. And then we let this whole thing go through, and then we look at the final, and we say, okay, we formed some terrestrial planets, we have some asteroids, um, so it looks like uh, we have been successful. This is only a concept to explain how we go from here to terrestrial planet formation. Yeah, this, I will explain what this concept means um, and how it incorporates a giant planet migration as well. Okay, so this is, like I said, it's just a concept to say that you start from, what, after giant planets are formed, what happens interior to the giant planets is interaction of embryos and planetesimals and formation of, of terrestrial planets after several hundred million years. These processes, these, these simulations that we do on computer um, are extremely stochastic and they are very, very sensitive to initial conditions. If you take two of these objects and put them a meter farther apart, you get a different result. If you remove one of these and put it here, you get a different result. If you take this setup from my computer and put it on your computer with a different internal structure, you get a different result. So you ask yourself if that's what it is, so how can we take this and rely on this? You can't. So the way that we do is, we take that and we run a ton of simulations for different initial conditions and we study them statistically. The idea is not to reproduce solar system. The idea is to understand what physics is the dominant factor to go from here to here. For instance, when we do this, we see that in all our simulations, Mars is too big, right? In, and when you see that in all your simulations, Mars is too big, it is not your fault. It is the physics. The physics is telling you something, right? The physics is telling you that there is more material here. Therefore, because accretion is local, you always, you always accrete what is around you. You know, uh, If I want to accrete 
become big. I accrete what is around me. Uh, and uh, I can't accrete something from back there unless, this is the key, so something, somehow, what is back there is flung into this region and then I grab it, right? Okay, keep that in mind. So because there is more mass here than here, Mars naturally should be bigger, right? It has more material to accrete. So it's not our fault, it comes from the physics, but it shouldn't be, Mars is smaller, right? So let's see what is the role of water here. Uh, go back to this cartoon, you look at this, you are a theorist, you say, this object is close to sun, is dry, but I know that Earth has water. It's right there, right? So where does this dry object get its water? You look at this and say, well, the watery stuff is back here. So somehow the watery stuff from here must have come to here, right? This was the idea behind bringing water through comets. So, Stuff is all the way, water your stuff is back there. Somehow comets came in and brought water and delivered water to Earth, except that it doesn't work for two reasons. If you look at the uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio of comets and, uh, and uh, ocean water, you see a discrepancy. This is Earth, and those are the comets. They don't agree with one another. When you present this to the promoters of the idea that water came from comets, they say, well, the water on Earth is not primordial. It has been um, influenced and uh, uh, its structure and its uh, chemical composition has changed during the evolution of the Earth, which is a solid argument and you can't argue with that. Except for one thing, uh, that may be true, but when you do the math, when you go back here and you say, okay, I want to start uh, from this region and I want to bring in enough comets to hit Earth to deliver all the water that we have. Just the water on the surface. Forget about the water on the mantle. Just the water on the surface. Uh, the math doesn't work. The rate of delivery is one every 10 million years. You can't bring in enough water if you put in the formation mechanism and the amount of water that, that, and the, the number of comets that come in, you can account for about 10 to 15 percent, no, no more than 15 percent. You still have to account for 85 percent of the water that cannot be delivered by comets, right? So you ask yourself, okay, what am I missing here? Okay. So this idea was promoted in 2000 by our colleagues in Nice, by Alessandro Morbidelli, John Chambers, and a few others. They said that although water, some part of the water could have come from farther comets, most of the water came in during the accretion, during the growth. The water here presumably was brought in after Earth growth was complete. Water was delivered as a late veneer. They said the water, watery material, was flying into the accretion zone, somehow was flying into the accretion zone of Earth, and it was incorporated into its accretion, into its formation, during the formation. That's what they said. Okay. And uh, they said, material here has more water compared to here. It doesn't have much, it may have 5%, 10%, but if you bring enough of it, then you can account for that 85% that you are missing. This is the same simulation that I showed. Now what I'm showing with the code, with the color coding, is the amount of water. Now if you look at the meteorites uh, and uh, uh, the amount of water they carry and where they come from, you can get some idea of how to distribute water in your primordial disk. So a material that is very close is dry. As you go farther away, they, they have more and more water. Now, same simulations, I want you to see the way that water material gets transferred from one region to another, right? It goes, things get radially mixed, you have objects from here, come here, come here, and eventually deliver water to Earth, right? That's the similar uh, uh, simulation. Okay. Well, this is all good. You deliver water to Earth, but your Mars is still big, right? This is, this is the Mars that is still big, right? So you came up with a mechanism that, that comes right out of physics. It makes perfect sense. And you can, uh, you can account for the water, but your Mars is still big, right? So how do you do that? Well, the only way 
people thought of the following. The only way that you can remove all this material, uh, the only way would be to remove material from accretion zone of Mars, so Mars will not have too much material to accrete, right? Um, so if it is big, because it has too much material to accrete. So Sean Raymond came up with this idea. He said, I'm going to put Jupiter initially on in an eccentric orbit. If I put it in eccentric orbit, its close approach to the outer part of the disk will be larger than uh, when uh, it is on circular orbit. All right. So that causes a lot of material from the region of Mars to go away just because, um, because Jupiter is initially in uh, uh, an eccentric orbit. And then you get something that has a small mass. Basically, artificially, put Jupiter originally when it forms, assume that when it forms, it forms in an eccentric orbit, and then that causes material, uh, that causes closer approach to the disk, removes material from the region where Mars is formed, and Mars becomes a small. Um, why can, can we do that? Of course we can do that. We don't know the initial condition of solar system, so you can play, you can do whatever you want. That's, that's the freedom that you have, right? We don't know how the disk uh, came about, we don't know the distribution, we don't know the number of planets. Do, do whatever you want. You know. What we see is the final product. And uh, because of that, you have that freedom to put planet at eccentric orbit. Of course, later on you have to come up with a mechanism to lower the eccentricity. The only bad thing about it is that once you do that, then your Earth will not have water. You basically remove watery material. The same material that is supposed to deliver water to Earth will go away because of interaction with Jupiter. This shows three types of snapshots, Jupiter in eccentric orbit, 0.1 and 0.2 eccentricity, and you see as you increase the eccentricity of Jupiter, the amount of water that goes to terrestrial planets becomes basically zero. Okay. <coughs> so you ask yourself, I have 10 minutes, I can do this. So you ask yourself, how do we do this? Eccentric Jupiter, eccentric Jupiter doesn't work. It removes this material that you need, right? But Material, but uh, Mars is a small because it didn't have too much material in its surrounding. How can you do that? Well, a toy model was presented in 2009 by Brad Hansen. Um, he, um, a theorist again, we do this. He said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, for no reason, for no good reason, I'm going to ignore the entire disk. This disk that I'm using here, he said, I'm going to ignore from here all the way. I'm going to throw it away from here forward. I'm going I'm to only take a small little bit of it here. That, from 0.7 to 1 AU. And I'm going to see whether I can form terrestrial planets here. Right. It is unrealistic. In reality, it doesn't exist. The disks are much longer. But it changed our views. So he, did, he took that. Of course, the idea in the past had been presented by many others, including our Japanese colleagues. They had uh, taken it, but they didn't pay attention to how that could be used to explain terrestrial planet formation. So he did his simulations, and he came up with a bunch of, he, did, he ran a bunch of simulations. He showed that at times you can actually get small objects like Mars to have a small mass, right? Uh, this is, now, how does this thing work? It works like this. <coughs> These objects, these are moon to Mars sized bodies. They hit each other, they break each other into pieces, and because they interact with each other through gravity, they throw each other out, out of the region, right? If your object falls into here, and there is nothing to accrete, it will maintain its mass, and because there is nothing here, there is nothing to perturb its orbit, it maintains its orbit, right? So if you do this right, you may be able to get Mars by this idea. This is called the edge, um, this is called the disk edge effect. If your disk has an edge, past that edge, there is no material or there is not enough material for any object that gets there to accrete and become big. That object maintains its mass and also its orbit will not be perturbed. Okay. So let's do a little bit of mathematics and see, uh, uh, bear with me for another five minutes as I will um, finish this. So originally we take the disk 
and we do our simulations with a disk like that and we distribute material based on that power law, R to ne power negative 3 half. Why? There is no good reason for it. Traditionally, it came out of the simulations. People did simulations and they noticed that um, the, when they, our Japanese colleague, they did their simulation and they noticed that when the disk settles, they can model that with the distribution with R to negative 3 halves. You know, that's, that's just fitting to the result of the simulations. <coughs> but you can take any model that you want. So this is what the graph, that, um, re, uh, that function represents. What uh, Brett Hansen did was that he took all that away, okay, and said there is nothing past that region. So your disk is basically that. This is all your disk, and this mathematical function to show its surface density is going by, by this line, and past that there is nothing else, right? Your planet formation starts over there, and Mars gets tossed here, there's nothing here, it stays and maintains its orbit and all that, okay? But in reality, the disks are long, we know that. We know what he presented was just a toy model. But the disks are, are long and big and they extend for tens of AU. The question is how you can go from here to here. Okay, you have two approaches. And the, these two approaches come from the fact that we don't know the initial condition of the solar system. So you can do it any way that you want. You can either assume that you, you can't do anything with sun. Sun is at rest. You can either assume <coughs> that the giant planets are free to be wherever they want. They can migrate, as you mentioned, right? They can, you can play with them any way you want. Or you can put giant planets where they are and play with your disk. You can say that, you can say that I know how to do this traditionally. This has been done for 30 years. If I know where giant planets are, this has been done for 30 years, I know how to do it, I know how to deliver water. I'm going to keep this, I'm going to keep sun, I'm going to move my giant planets around, right? So you have sun, you have disk that has helped you for 30 years to form giant planets and deliver water, sorry, to form terrestrial planets and deliver water. Your giant planets is your freedom. You put it wherever you want. And then you say, I want to remove this part and only keep that part. How do I do that? I move the giant planet forward. And I bring it so close that it gives me amounts of mass that is necessary to do Brett Hansen's model, but I introduce another giant planet. And I time all this so well that when this one put, removed the material and left me only with this much, the other one catches up with it and take it back and uh, I have terrestrial planet formation, right? This is called Grand Tech model. You have giant planets, you put it at where you think it should be and it helps, it works. And then you start moving it and you time this migration with the migration of another giant planet and you try to make sure that at the time that you get what you want, the two giant planets catch up with each other and this the little one catches big one and they go back, right? As they go back, they scatter whatever material they scattered before back into uh, the terrestrial region. You will have your asteroid belt and you have your giant planets on it. It's very interesting. Um, there is one big problem with it. Um, it's man-made, you know. <laughs> it's cooked up to do this. Uh, it has many um, arbitrary ad hoc um, uh, initial conditions. For instance, you must have um, Jupiter form, fully formed at 3.5 AU. Uh, your Saturn has to be at about 5 AU and it has to be only 20%. The time of the formation for Saturn to, be, to become fully formed, it, has, it must be only 300,000. The rate of migration for the two planets has to match. It means that because this planet migrates because of the effect of the disk, the mass of this disk has to be only a certain amount. In other words, from an infinite large amount of uh, parameter space, there is only one tiny bit that works for it. 
you can't say this is not the true one. Our solar system is very different from all other 3,000 planetary systems we have discovered, right? So maybe there is something about that one point. You can't exclude it because it works for one point. But when your probability for the formation is limited only to one point in an infinitely large parameter space, you're not asking questions how probable this model is, right? So keep that in mind. Now your other approach would be go over there and say, well, the disk that this whole system represents is not just this, it's a two-step disk. One step is presented by that function, the other step is presented by nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, there is a region that is, in other words, your disk may have a region. Before that, that there is more mass, after that there is more mass, but there is a region that locally the disk is depleted, right? If you wonder what that means, it means that before that runaway growth happened, right, your disk, your planetesimals form with non-homogeneity. There is, there is more planetesimals somewhere, there's less somewhere else. Remember I, I said that from here to here takes about half a million years ago? So this is your time of, if you put your t equals zero here, you have no choice but to play with giant planets. If you put t equals zero over there, then your disk will become also a freedom as well, a free parameters as well. So um, let me let me just show the simulations. You take the same same simulations as before. You make a toy model for it. You remove some material arbitrarily from different areas, and then you run simulations to see what happens if you remove material for say 25 percent, 75 percent from here, here, and and then you let giant planets migrate. You let them be on where they are on eccentric orbit. You run all those simulations, and you come up with. Um, a bunch of final results, and then you see that, yeah, it, is, it may be possible to get um, Mars to be small, uh, it may be possible, yeah, uh, it looks like there's a possibility of getting Mars to be small, makes sense as well. This is one of the simulations, for instance, and that is Mars. And uh, um, you, get, you get Venus and Earth and Mars and big asteroids and smaller asteroids and all that. It looks like it, it works. What is the connection between these two models? Uh, the connection is the following. Uh, this represents planetesimals, this represents embryos. There is a local depletion in the disk, right? Now look at here. The Mars can form here and get tossed into this region, but because there is not too much mass here, it doesn't have mass to accrete, and it doesn't have anything to perturb its orbit. Right? Or it can form here and get tossed to that region, right? From these two. Now, see what happens here. I'm going to take that part of the way. Um, hold on a second. I'm going to take that part of the way and I'm going to put these two lines around there. This is, this is the Grand Tech model, right? This is the partially depleted disk model that says the disk may have non uniformities and Mars can form in either of this mass enhanced region and get tossed to this region. And the Grand Tech says, Mars formed in a non-uniform region, but get tossed to a region where there was no mass. Right? This is basically your grand tag model. Okay, I'm going to finish. Uh, this, this is uh, the final the result I want to, uh, the final cartoon I want to show. Uh, let's see what we have here. Okay, so <coughs> the giant planet formation um, has its own problem, and uh, the problem is that uh, the correct region model, which is the most promising one and can be easily applied to extrasolar planet, has a time scale problem. You have to um, take that into account. Uh, you have to either fix correct region model or come up with other models like pebble accretion. Um, and, and once you form uh, giant planets, then you have to ha have to form terrestrial planets. Terrestrial planets formation takes much longer, and therefore influenced by giant planets. The problem with terrestrial planets formation in our solar system is that Mars is a small, and in order to take Mars into account, that, that in order to explain its small mass, you have to uh, make sure that you deliver water. You explain the asteroid belt and all those properties and everything. So currently, there are these three models that exists. I didn't explain a pebble accretion, but ask me if you want to know. I have two slides to show you. So, um, <coughs> the current promising models that form terrestrial planets and also deliver water and they can account for the structure of the asteroid belt are these three models. 
uh, classical model, grand tech model, and what happened over there? Uh, there is, oh yeah, let's put this here, there you go. And uh, partially depleted disk model. If you put your time t equals zero for your simulations, where the system has gone through runaway growth and oligarchic growth. Remember runaway growth, the hill radius thing? If you put your um, time t equals zero here, where planetary embryos have already formed, you have no choice but to either assume a fixed orbit for giant planets, that is your classical model, or move giant planets around, that's your grand tech model. If you go one step back, a couple of million years back, or maybe half a million years back, and put t equals zero, where the process of runaway growth, but the process of going from planetesimals to planetary embryos is starting. If you start from there and let the whole thing go through, the fact that planetesimal formation is non-homogeneous will help you to form Mars. That is this depleted model. And you can form Mars within the first two million years as, as suggested by um, evidence from meteorites. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. A new model has recently come out as pebble accretion, which suggests that <coughs> if you have a big planetary embryo sitting isolated in a swarm of material, a swarm of centimeter sized bodies coming towards it, the, the small planetary embryo can act like a sponge and attract these uh, centimeter sized bodies, but they rapidly grow to become so big to attract gas from its surrounding and become giant planet. Um, you can form giant planets in, in about half a million years or so, uh, while gas is still around. And at the same time, you can put that planetary embryo at one, at one AU and do the same thing with it at one AU and it shows you that you can form um, terrestrial planets and maybe even more. However, this model still at its infancy, it cannot explain, it, it, is, it only works in isolation. It only forms in isolation. It does not take into account interaction of uh, giant planets with one another. It cannot explain uh, delivery of water, uh, it cannot explain the architecture of the asteroid belt, and more importantly, it cannot explain the initial formation of that one big embryo that is needed to attract all these centimeter sized objects. Right? And there, there, there's all this. Um, it, is, it is good when you put it in an isolated box and away from everything else, and you put the centimeter sized bodies in a place that their swarm actually comes towards the, uh, uh, towards the embryo and the embryo absorbs them. But past that, it basically, uh, it hasn't been explored yet. It has a lot of room to explore. I'm going to uh, stay, uh, stop here. Uh, I went five minutes over time. I apologize for that. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks so much.